First, a few remarks just to uh, pick up from, I think, a couple of the questions at the end of the hour yesterday afternoon, and then uh, I wanted to continue on going in the, in the direction of the expert systems. Uh, first, a bit of compare and contrast and where we are in terms of the, the big picture on both the Valley uh, Rice Irrigation example and the, uh, and the Yellow Rain. In terms of evidential base, the biggest difference, at least as far as I can see, between the rice irrigation and the yellow rain is the evidence that comes in the form of deception, uh, which is in the chemical and biological weapons investigation. And in the case of the rice irrigation, that much is not there. So that, of course, creates a complicated problem of w weighting evidence. And uh, what we showed yesterday is by no means the last word on the subject. And, a number of you raised this question, couldn't we put that in a more formal Bayesian context? Maybe yes, maybe no. I think uh, one really just has to try. Uh, I did not go to the trouble of uh, developing a scoring scheme on the Balinese ir irrigation uh, system since that was not data that I collected. That was really work of Steve Lansing. But uh, he's published a lot of stuff on that topic. And, uh, if anybody's interested in wading through it, the uh, references to virtually all of it are in uh, the book called Perfect Order, which is listed in the, among the readings. And I would strongly recommend that to anybody that wants to get further into the topic. But you could go through the entire numerical exercise that we did uh, on the uh, yellow rain example with the uh, Bali ir irrigation. And it would be somewhat simpler because, uh, and I think probably quite a bit cleaner because the deception end is not there. But uh, I don't know how that exercise would come out, but I think it's uh, for anybody that wants to play this game, that's worth doing. And then you could take all the different forms of evidence that uh, Lansing assembled and ask, can you fit that systematically into some Bayesian structure? And, get far more, more quantitative than he does. And again, I don't know the answer to that. So uh, it's an exercise that's doable. And uh, I would hope you know, somebody somewhere along the line would pick that up and have a go with it. Now, we had mentioned just uh, almost uh, cursorily in the form of a sentence or two some uh, issues about causality. Now, in both of the examples yesterday, you end up with attributions of causality in the following sense. There is a specific chain of mechanism or chain of explanation, if you like, that uh, explains how each of the phenomena uh, operate, namely the irrigation system and what it is that gave rise to, this, to the yellow rain. And those are both examples where you don't have a lot of any, virtually any replication to go on. Uh, you're making causal attribution on the basis of a single observation. In both instances, you don't have the, if you like, a formal model structure written out within which to think about the causal mechanism. And again, it's not to say that you might not be able to push things that far, but it's all waiting to happen. So uh, I thought I would at least raise that as the, uh, at least an instance where you are carrying out this causal attribution without a lot of the, uh, how to put it, the standard fanfare that I think most of you are used to hearing about. And for sure, there is no randomized trial that's connected up with any of that. This is all observational evidence being assembled from multiple sources with multiple, uh, uh, if you like, gradations of confidence that you can assign to it. But that's the nature of the package. So, are there questions about that much? Yeah. I have a question about um, the comment that you made that you only have one observation. Um, <clears throat> if I were to take this book, for example, and do that, we would attribute that to gravity, even though we only have one observation. So, my, my question is to what extent does kind of like our outside understanding from other scientific observations allow us to make causal, causal inferences based on like a single observation? Well, I think a lot, because what you just did. And the question you're asking is something I think uh, a two-year-old could respond to. 
And the two-year-old wouldn't have the word gravity there, but I think the two-year-old has seen things fall and would know there's, uh, that it, if you held this book out and released it, it's headed down and not up. And so that kind of attribution is going on. And there's some nice papers of uh, Susan Carey and Rebecca Sachs, uh, Susan Carey at uh, Harvard, asking the question, at what age do infants first start to have the ability to be able to ascertain just what you d did, or at least have a sense of what's going to happen next? Uh, and, you know, it seems, you know, within a few months, there's some sense of, uh, or some ability to, to make uh, these attributions without having the vocabulary. They've obviously never heard of gravity. And so I think there's a large body of neurophysiology to be understood uh, and uh, to be able to relate it about how we, in fact, make such inferences. I don't have that. I don't know if that's. Uh, um, I, I guess it's a, it's a statement of ignorance about the subject as well. But I guess I'm thinking of it from a slightly different angle, from the standpoint that <clears throat> let's say we observe an economic phenomenon that happens just once, right? But we've observed related phenomena right? that don't necessarily have to do with the same interact. Maybe maybe it's like a methodological difference, right? Like people more qualitative researchers would say historically we saw this and that and that happen when there were similar kinds of conditions. This phenomenon happened once. There's kind of like a. It seems reasonable to believe that this is causing X in this particular circumstance, using what we know from like related. I think that's certainly going on. And if you wanted to uh, go in the direction of this Bayesian discussion from yesterday, that would be the basis of your f setting up, in effect, an empirical prior. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, okay. not from replication. It's not from exact replication, but there's a diversity of similar things. And now you want to quantify that in terms of some prior distribution on what's likely to happen. So yes, that is certainly going on. I mean, this came up, I, I don't recall who asked the question. It was in the uh, medical diagnostics uh, example because, uh, yes, you have a unique patient and a decision has to be made. <laughs> in terms of diagnosis, and doesn't the physician use information from uh, previous experience? Well, the answer is yes, but there's such heterogeneity among the patients that they're in exactly the same position that uh, you describe, where there's, let me call it analogies, some similarities, but uh, you can't, by any stretch of the imagination, call it replication that you're dealing with. Well, Bert, did you give an example of that Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to call that causality, would you? Because you're inferring, you know, this is just a correlation to repeated patterns. It may or may not be a causal. So there's no mechanism to try to explain that. And, and then you get from the Blanton book that the theory is how exactly you can infer the Paris group. Yeah, that is actually fairly tightly woven together. Right. Yeah. Then Well, actually, the counterfactual <laughs> study in the case of Bali, it actually was carried out because the Dutch did it. it. It wasn't the Indonesian government, but the Dutch and the Green Revolution. So th those were actually experiments with alternatives. Uh, I, mean, the ex uh, I mean, what it led to was, uh, yeah, yeah. But I'm not, so we'll go further with regard to. No, 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 I'm just saying you use the word cause. I mean, this example of the, the infant, I don't want to waste time on that. No, 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 it's, it's OK. Go ahead. The book falls. I think it's far from the notion of a uniform gravitational field. Or, I don't even know if we actually do understand the cause of gravity. Uh, nobody has yet seen it. But. Yeah, nobody's seen it. Nobody's, but I mean, putting to that, I mean, there is a different notion about where you might intrude in mechanisms. So maybe the Dutch and the Green Police are right. Suppose that we have the American Air Force bombing uh, the third terraces. Uh, what would that do for the reorganization of Italian society or something? Just, I mean, those kinds of counterfactual exercises are generally more associated with the meaning of causality than they are not. 
Uh, yes, I would agree. Uh, I don't know any counterfactual analysis that's been done on the right fields. You could, you could do it, but... Yeah. That's correct. Um, that is absolutely correct. This thing in relation to these prior experiences, which ones actually bear on them? And I'm not sure how a prior. Um, well, if I was sure how it would have ended, you would have seen it. Uh, but uh, I wanted to respond at least some to the, uh, well, let me call it a challenge put up yesterday about that. But yeah, I'm not sure that, you, uh, that there's real payoff from that. I just don't know. Anybody else? You? You may not end up with a conclusive statement is what will happen. Let me mention, uh, I hadn't intended to talk about this, but the, uh, you're raising this, this uh, suggests I should say a little bit. There's a quite interesting paper. It was published in 1959 of Bush and Mosteller called A Comparison of Eight Models. What this is, is eight learning models. And all eight are formalized. And they say different things about uh, uh, basically uh, speed at which learning takes place, are there delays, what drives it, and then there's uh, a data set. And uh, 14 criteria are set up, and what the, those 14 criteria are doing is they're dealing with the question, what features of observed learning curves are you going to demand that a model be able to reproduce before you say, now I've got a good explanation? So they run a contest among these eight models, and five of them are clearly filtered out, but there's three left in, in the running. And on the basis of the data there, you can't go further. And they're, not they're, not, they're by no means equivalent, but the benefit of the exercise is they do suggest additional experiments to do that would allow you to go further. So I don't think the process stops at round one. Uh, and if you want to extend that even to this yellow rain example, you can say, well, uh, well in fact, suppose there was uh, virtually a dead heat between two of the hypotheses. What you would probably be able to do, in fact, I'm almost sure you would, is be able to say, what additional evidence must I be able to assemble to discriminate further? So that's, that's the next round. So I think that iterative process is something that's there, and I, I think there's no escaping it. Is that OK? OK. Yeah. Your question is, how would abduction fit into economics? OK. Like a complete positive binary relation, which is rational preference relation, 
then out of the how many of observed choices the non-demanded that are explained by this specific correlation. So then you would say, well, now there's not many observed facts that this really explains. But on the other hand, um, it is analytically trustable, so it is linked to the utility representation of preference correlation. And so that helps you work with utility functions. And once you have utility functions, you also have like a bunch of other theories that I mean, and this theory is like a building block for them. Yeah, so okay. I would say like there are, in economics, there might be other criteria, like also analytical trustability can be one criterion by which you judge theories. Also, they're linked to other theories, like not only the correction of direct facts that you're really supposed to explain. Um, this then we probably should dismiss those as one of the core Well, are you prepared to entertain that? Uh, it would force you to think about a new core of microeconomics then. <laughs> well, this is not a full answer to your question, but uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot with this, but, <laughs> but uh, there is, to my mind, a very good paper uh, that does abduction in economics. Uh, it's actually one of Jim's. Uh, it's something I like a lot, but it doesn't seem to get on the reading list so much anymore. Uh, on the impact of Title VII legislation on the economic status of blacks. Uh, from the JEL, what, 19, 20 years ago or so. But that is a good, I think, a good example of abduction. I don't know, do you, do you want to say a little bit about that? Okay, well, no, I think I, I paper, I it's worth putting up on the, I think, in the readings because it, it does fit with this. Yeah. No, you know, literally, you say, I want things to be steady state. I 
get very strong functional form restrictions that are repeatedly violated by the data. So that's a real question as to whether or not you, you will go that route and say, I, I believe in RBC and we worship at that altar, or say, no, I might want to reconstitute this. Okay, and I have a question in direct response to this question. Why do you think your argument is going to apply to the next one? Why would you think that it would be? Because, I mean, it's, I mean, I don't know who it was going to also think that perhaps they were asking for more information, but I think you understand the question. I mean, well, they're easy to understand. I mean, that was, that was the point. Do you understand? Is that too easy to understand? I think it is partly easy. It's easy to understand. I mean, why do we believe in Cobb Douglas production classes? I mean, we don't really. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, okay. Well, let me say something about that. But, but the other thing is, just to stick with, you know, to stick with Kuznets for a second, I mean, that wasn't a situation where you had some uh, tight set of equations written down. He had the picture in his head, qualitatively different explanations. In the same sense, we talked about it yesterday, but it wasn't at the point where uh, he's sitting there writing down a model in advance and saying, okay, or this model or a couple of them are what we're playing off. It was basically letting the data talk with the idea that there could be a totally different formulation that would come on the table. Yeah. Wait a minute. There were thousands, hundreds of these plantations. Why is this plantation like every other plantation? You know, we have these yeah. you know, or maybe it's totally different, this plantation. And there's a lot of people who are not going to be able to do that. And that's what I'm saying. 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 And
putting it, something in its place is obvious. So we just simply say we don't know. So that's what, see, Bush and Moscow are learning how to, uh, and, uh, No. We don't really know among these three different learning things that they're distinguishing. They would have been not punished so much. But Bush probably more than Moscow. <laughs> yeah, well, the, Bush would get it from the psychology community, but Moscow was outside. But nevertheless, I thought it was a fair-minded uh, trading off. But in the end, you know, if you're looking for uh, finality of conclusion, it simply wasn't there. But you could say what additional information you needed to collect. Let me make uh, your, I, yeah, I, how to put it, I, I sense some frustration in the, on the basis of the question you're asking. So let me just add a little more about this. Uh, in my travels, uh, I spend time in some, in some other fields that operate in a quite different manner from economics. And uh, uh, various precincts in biology are of that character. And I think in many instances, they're much more empirically driven without formal models written down in advance. And the game that's played is you ask, can I kind of summarize the, the empirical regularities I'm seeing in data, for example, from uh, some experiments? And uh, you don't do that in a vacuum, but it's not with formal models written down. And then multiple people, uh, they'll replicate the experiment that, you, uh, that maybe you've done, and some people will do it with some additional perturbations. And then there's a, th a theoretical uh, picture put in place, which does involve equations. And this process keeps going on, but then, uh, I don't know uh, what you want to make of this, but I guess I first uh, was uh, curious about this. At the time I was a graduate student, my own thesis advisor asked the quite eminent geneticist, what's the expected length of time of a theory in genetics? And the answer that came back was six weeks. <laughs> yeah, that's before the new round of studies get uh, carried out, which are overthrowing what's already on the table. So. The notion of just walking around, you know, with a kind of a fixed set of models and say, well, this is the way the subject's going. I mean, if you did that in their game, you'd never get it, and you'd be left in the cloud of dust. So it functions in a somewhat different way. Uh, <laughs> Well, that's helpful. And I don't think we disagree. No, 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 that's, that's fine. Is that? OK. OK. Uh, I came to talk about something else. <laughs> OK, let me skip these. OK, abduction and expert system. So what is this about? Uh, you want to think now about situations where a body, the bodies of evidence that could be assembled uh, to account for various facts are sufficiently large that uh, operating, relatively speaking, by hand, as we did yesterday, is not going to be a viable option. And so without some computer assistance, uh, you're not going to really make much progress. So the first of the expert systems that was put up to uh, deal with this is the dendral system, about which uh, there are several readings. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to illustrate uh, some of what goes on inside dendral, but using data that's not, not theirs. It's data from actual studies I've been involved with uh, myself, so that uh, it uses a lot of the same technology. But uh, hopefully it'll give a flavor of at least uh, the lines of reasoning that go on uh, inside uh, at least the first of the expert systems with the idea that uh, this has been carried out and generalized in a lot of different directions. But uh, where I think we'll end up is the challenge to kind of push this 
further in areas which are not so tightly defined as organic chemistry, and uh, which is, uh, of course, where the dendral system uh, got its start. Now, I'm going to have to say a few things about organic chemistry to get, the, get this going. And uh, this is not with the idea of running a primer on that subject. So I'll try to present an, enough information so that uh, if you kn knew nothing about this topic, at least you could get some feel for uh, what the nature of the questions are that are being asked and how they're being addressed and why you uh, really had to uh, get into this development of uh, uh, software for, if you like, doing at least some reasoning of a kind that a very good chemist would do, but now you're asking a computer to carry it off. So again, just to reiterate what the original question was, this uh, went to Josh Letterberg. It's uh, what measurements would you uh, make and what's the technology you would put on some rocket that's going to be sent to Mars to land there, and then there's going to be samples taken from soil samples and so on. And uh, you, you would like to know what it is you should look for if you wanted to answer the question, is there possibly life on Mars? So the first thing that, of course, comes to mind then is you need uh, organic compounds, the simplest of which are the family of hydrocarbons, which means that they are molecules made up of just carbon and hydrogen. And I want to just stick with that for a few minutes and uh, not get into the, fo uh, the formal details of having oxygen radicals hooked on and nitrogens and so on but just to illustrate the flavor of the kind of questions being asked. Okay, so to begin with hydrocarbons, all the way on the left, there are names for molecules people here have probably heard of endless times. Methane, ethane, propane is a gas that you, uh, you may use, in fact, for a, a grill at a barbecue, <laughs> butane and so on, and, uh, octane in, in your gasoline. And then there's a chemical formula for these. And of course, if you've had zero chemistry, all this means is that associated with the C, which is carbon, it tells you how many carbon atoms there are in the molecule. The H tells you how many hydrogens. And then there's rules by which the carbons and the hydrogens have to be hooked up, or I should say constraints, uh, which would give you a, a particular structure for the molecule with this formula. And I want to switch to the next slide and then come back to this one. Here's a picture of uh, C4H10. So from the previous slide, this is butane. And this is a standard chemical diagram showing you what's referred to as the backbone, or if you like, skeleton of that molecule. And the skeleton is defined in terms of the arrangement of the carbon atoms. The carbons all have uh, to be hooked up, each one of them, to four, uh, to four other atoms. The H's correspond to the hydrogen. And what's listed here on the top is simply a diagram that shows you one possible picture of four carbons hooked up to 10 hydrogens. Now, below it, there's another picture of four carbons hooked up to 10 hydrogens. And so you ask the question, is this just uh, leaving you a lot of free choice in drawing a picture? Or is there something, or is there the germ of a more complex general idea going on here. Well, it turns out this is the germ of a much more general idea, namely that if you have technology for detecting uh, information at the level of what's the formula of the uh, hydrocarbon you're seeing, namely C4H10, does that uniquely identify the actual molecule that's there? Well, the answer is no, because there are what are called isomers, and the isomers represents something where you still have four carbons hooked up to 10 hydrogens. But if you look at the structural diagram, these two are actually quite different. And uh, isomers don't necessarily have the same properties. If they come in the form of liquids, they can have different boiling points. They may be stable or unstable if it's a gas, depending upon the pressure, pressure of the surrounding uh, uh, environment in which, in, in which they're, they're, they're operating. And so telling you just the chemical formula by itself, which you can get fairly easily, or relatively easily, through uh, mass spectrometry, the technology that was uh, brought into play for dendrol, is not telling you 
by itself uniquely what's going on. You have these alternative configurations, structural ones, which may have quite different properties, and for practical purposes, they represent really different molecules. Now, where does life get a bit more complicated? Once you get beyond the simplest of these uh, uh, hydrocarbons of the form CNH to the 2N plus 2, which is one whole family, what's called the methane series in, uh, on hydrocarbons, what you start to see, if you count up number of isomers, it starts at 2, 3, 5, 9, 18, and starts growing pretty fast. And by the time you have uh, 14 or 16 carbons here, you ask, well, how many isomers are out there? You quickly get up to numbers in the range of about 300,000. And uh, you say, well, gee, you know, I've got one chemical formula. I've got all of these different structures. Now what am I going to do to discriminate among them? Because my instrumentation is going to tell me it may be uh, C16H34, but now if I've got 300,000 alternatives <laughs> in which to arrange that, well, now, now you have a problem on your hands. So uh, one of a high degree of non-uniqueness. So you ask, well, how can you think about even be beginning to winnow it down? Well, you need at least some information, uh, which uh, given that there had never been a previous rocket to Mars since the, before the Viking mission, uh, you kind of have to trust uh, uh, earlier day astrophysics, which gives you some indication of what are the pressures in the atmosphere on Mars. Now, just stop with that a second, because th there are various pressure ranges at which some of these isomers, for example, are unstable. They're not likely to be persistent. And there's others that, uh, not just one, but there can be maybe several thousand that are still going to be in contention, just given what you uh, knew in advance, or if you like, your prior about pressure on Mars. Now, if you go to the temperatures, uh, that's not the same as on Earth, but you could, there's a lot of experimentation that's been done with various isomers that go even with this methane series. So if you start bringing in temperature and pressure, you start to narrow down the set of alternatives. Well, you can't necessarily narrow them down uh, to the point where, ah, there's only one. You're not going to have a couple hundred thousand constraints you can put in in advance, but you can end up with a much shorter list. And so one of the things that went into the dendral system was to first ask the question, do, can I have a systematic way of even generating what all the isomers are? Now, if you go back to the picture we drew here, you say, oh, I mean, look, I can just play with this diagram a bit and see what that looks like. And, but this happens to be a molecule where there's only two possibilities. Well, as soon as you get up to large numbers, and you even want to get to the point of asking, what's the next number in this sequence, analogous to this uh, somewhat uh, humorous example of Joe Keller about the subway stops in New York. Uh, what was discovered fairly early on, and by this I mean back in the 19th century, there doesn't seem to be any simple recursive formula you can write down that's going to tell you what the count is as soon as you go from C10H22 to C11H24. And uh, so then you ask, well, OK, it looks like to even find out how many of these there are, something fairly subtle is going to go on. Well. There were numerous attempts to count isomers, even of uh, hydrocarbons in this series that uh, go back to around the 1890s into about 1910. But the first fairly complete analysis wasn't published till 1931. And there are algorithms that will allow you to systematically generate, go through uh, the entire hydrocarbon series and go from simpler molecules, simpler isomers to the more complex ones and so get you to the point where you could write a computer program that'll tell you how to do it. And if you couldn't do that, then talking about an expert system that's going to be able to at least lay out what are the options that need to be considered uh, is going to be out of the question. So that was there to begin with. Yeah. So the idea is that you have um, a certain number of combinatorial plus uh, yes. combinations given the balances of the molecules or If it can exist, you have to then go further and say, it can exist, but under what conditions? So now you need more information. Yeah. So that's where the pressure, the temperature, and all that come in. So the number is about, uh, this is the number that could be naturally occurring. 
Yes, this at least lists all the possibilities. So all the possibilities are not something anybody's going to be able to carry around in their head if you get too complicated on this. Uh, but the point is, once you have an algorithm by, where you can actually write a computer program to generate it, then all the structures are there inside. And then you have to ask, well, given additional constraints, so more information being put in, which, uh, which of the options are still in contention for what you've got in your sample and which ones are not? So that, that's the idea. Now, having mentioned this in the context of uh, the methane series with a com fairly complete answer that you could actually implement with computer programs uh, as of 1931, the question is uh, what came next? Well, as soon as you get to somewhat more complicated forms of molecules that involve oxygens hooked on and nitrogens, then uh, Systematic algorithms were not out there at all. And one of the real, uh, I think, uh, major achievements of the Dendrol project is that it had a nice mathematical co component getting to the point where you could actually have algorithms to list all the possible isomers of much more complicated molecules. And uh, this was actually uh, Josh Letterberg, who was not somebody that grew up in graph theory and combinatorics doing it. And uh, the one thing I'll tell you, which I found, I found it was a rather amazing experience. Uh, when I was a graduate student, this was uh, through the math department at Stanford, every couple of weeks, one of the faculty members would give a two hour talk, the first hour of which was the history of their area of mathematics. The second hour was a presentation of unsolved problems, open ones. Now, one of these talks was actually given by Letterberg, who was not in the math department. And he came with this, basically this problem, not for the methane series, but slightly more complicated uh, molecules, because that was the time when the dendral system was actually being programmed up and implemented. And he came in and he said, uh, I'm just, I'm not here to tell you much, I'm here to, I'm here calling for help. Now, sitting in the audience, among others, was George Polia, who was a major figure in graph theory and combinatorics. And Letterberg just laid out the questions and said, he's rather puzzled by the fact that uh, mathematicians seem to need to go beyond two and three dimensions in, uh, before they're happy in discussing the structure of graphs. And he said, here we are with these chemicals. These, we live in this three-dimensional world. So he w just rattled off a whole series of unsolved problems in the math literature. and. Uh, there wasn't much help coming by the end of the day, but uh, after a period of roughly two years, they did come to closure on uh, being able to at least say what the options were, isomers, in terms of uh, more complicated hydrocarbons that were listed here. So that's the basis for beginning to do, if you like, some searching uh, when you take lists of possible molecules that are there, their structure, and additional constraints from what you know about the environment uh, that you're operating in to ask, well, OK, what's really out there that, you can, uh, that you're seeing? And I should also say that in the process, uh, what you end up with is uh, structures. And by structures, I mean the difference between this and that, for example. You can make this, and you can make that in a laboratory setting, but to really understand its properties comes a whole new round of experiments. So there were discoveries, in effect, of uh, characteristics of isomers in the course of the Dendral project, uh, just to be able to put down uh, constraints beyond what anyone knew in advance, because this was the first time anybody had, had access, to, if you like, to a full listing of the possible options of what you would see. So, that, at least to begin with, was what was put in in terms of uh, basic software to, uh, and uh, information to be searched with data that came from the uh, mass spectrometry and NMR spectroscopy. Now, this is a picture I don't expect uh, anybody to sit down and digest. It comes from a different place, but, lim but it basically has the ingredients of what you were confronted with with actual data in the, from the dendral system. What we said was that with each of those named molecules, you could list all the isomers. But that's the A molecule. 
Now you come along and it doesn't matter whether you stick a spade in the ground on Mars or you're taking tissue samples from some human or you're looking at blood, urine from some animal or what have you, uh, you don't only see a single molecule. You see a conglomerate of them. So when you actually look at what spectra look like, and this is uh, NMR spectra, so what that means here is that you have some, uh, let's, let's just talk about urine, for example, if we're doing it on humans. You have a urine sample from humans, you put it in a magnetic field, and the molecules, whatever is in there, they have different numbers of hydrogens attached to different sets of carbons, the different organic molecules in there, and depending upon what molecules are there, uh, you see what's referred to as a chemical shift, or the magnetic field can basically pull uh, the molecule in one direction or another, and uh, the extent to which the magnetic field is, if you like, acting on individual molecules is giving you a signature of what its concentration is in the particular fluid, and then these concentration chemical shift uh, data, which is what this is, they, they represent signatures of different molecules. Now, this is a picture where you see lots of different molecules all overlaid on top of one another, and you ask, well, gee, how can I pull all this apart? Because if you looked at any one of them, for example, creatinine on the top line, that big peak and a few things either side of it, with everything else flat, is what you would see if you just looked at spectra of just straight creatinine. But uh, in order to know that even that's where it belongs, you somehow need this catalog. So on top of the a, a catalog of spectra. So what else went into the dendral system is a catalog of spectra of organic molecules and their associated isomers so that when uh, you ended up asking what's in the ground or what are you digging up in Mars uh, and you have a picture like this, if you don't have a catalog of, of at least what some of these molecules look like by themselves, what their signature is, you haven't a prayer of even getting started. Then you just have a signal you can't interpret. So this is kind of the picture of, the raw, uh, of what raw data looks like. And for the moment, I'll leave aside where uh, exactly the study that this came from, but this is to communicate the idea. So you need stored spectra. OK. Then let's go a bit further. On the basis of the stored spectra and uh, being able to actually put names on the peaks there, uh, now I'll tell you a bit about where this thing came from. You ought to be able to at least present some kind of summary that tells you, that gives you an analysis of what am I looking at here? I mean, that's basically what you wanted to do. So on the basis of literally the spectra from the previous picture, where did that actually come from? I'll only take a minute to tell you. This was a study of character getting at the metabolic signature of parasitic infection. What, does, what does a parasite infection, specifically with schistosomiasis parasites, do to your ability to uh, metabolize food, energy metabolism? Uh, what does it have to do with your ability to metabolize fat? Can it do harmful things to you, such as create liver damage of some kind? And in any of these uh, interruption, if you like, or perturbation of energy metabolism, fat metabolism, you have to ask the question, which of these molecules is doing it? So there's a fair bit known about that, but to find out what the molecules are that are operating and the extent to which there's a perturbation due to the fact that there's an infection, uh, you need to have, if you like, the standard spectra up there. So that's from inside the dendral system. So on the basis of these spectra, now, uh, this is urine spectra, and this is a, actually a mouse. This is a mouse study of uh, schistosomiasis infection. What's listed with red there, that corresponds to perturbations in gut microbes inside the mice. So you can't talk about a parasitic infection and just the host, but it's the parasite, the host, and the gut bacteria as well. That's a statement about parasitic infections. Then what what's in green here is energy metabolism. There's a whole chemical system that gets disrupted 
by parasites, and you ask, how do you know that? Well, you have to obviously know which of these molecules is involved in energy metabolism, so it's the things in green, uh, and the arrows that go up or down are telling you whether or not, in the course of this perturbation, you've seen a deviation upwards or downwards from normal conditions free of the infection. You go to fat metabolism, that's the yellowish, uh, you have the same kind of summary. So roughly speaking, this is the kind of thing that uh, you, you'd like to make a picture like this. It wouldn't, be on, it wouldn't be on metabolism, but you would have to ask the question, if I'm seeing a signature of these molecules, am I seeing them necessarily in the same way I see them on Earth? Or is there something on Mars that says that things look a little different, but it's, it's in fact that molecule? So that's what this is attempting to get at. Now you ask, well, how do you do discrimination uh, between what you would call standard conditions and what you're seeing at a new site, like the Mars one? Now let's just go back to this picture. I want you to think about this now in terms of potential number of variables that you're going to have to put into some kind of analysis. Basically, along the x-axis, and I'll show this in a more precise manner uh, in a few minutes, uh, you should think of a narrow little bin. And each bin corresponds to a, a narrow range of chemical shift in units of parts per million. And there's roughly a thousand variables indexing the horizontal axis, or a thousand bins. Each one of those bins is a variable. And the amplitude that's sitting in each one of those bins is the, if you like, a response on that variable. So you're in a situation where you've got roughly, yeah, a thousand variables and responses, and you want to ask, well, are there regularities here? Can you distinguish between what comes out on the thousand variables on the top line, if you like, the standard, versus what's in the test case, and that comes down on the bottom? Well, there's a lot of standard technology that you probably know a fair bit about. One place to cut in is on principal components. So you come and do principal components on this big thing, and you ask, can I tell the standard from what else is out there? Well, this is a really cut-down picture of another schistosomiasis study, Schisto Japonicum, uh, which is, uh, operates in Asia. And the whole point of this is to ask, can you even see qualitatively a distinction between the standard and, if you like, the new setting, or the controls and the, uh, the, controls and the infected? So, Basically here, uh, what this is looking at is only controls, and th this, this is interesting in itself uh, in, <laughs> in terms of an animal study. Th this is a picture only of controls, and it's from two trials which are intended to be replicates. And you say, oh, everything, all over the map. So you say, well, why am I even taking the trouble to show you this? It's uh, only to say that you got to look carefully at, it, at the conditions un under which the, the data collection goes on. In the Mars context, is it night on Mars or is it day? That, re, that corresponds to a temperature difference. Here you've got simply trial one and trial two. So you say it's a laboratory setting. Why is there so much variation? Turns out one of these trials was carried out at the natural time of year when the animals involved, these were hamsters, hibernate. And the other was in an active period. So it's Replicated trials, but at two different times a year. But it's not the same animal, basically. And so what you're actually seeing in terms of variation here is hibernation, and uh, or the effects of hibernation. Or if you carry it to the Mars setting, it's temp uh, big temperature variations. OK, let's go a bit further. Then infected versus uninfected. You can't, uh, well, OK, the point is, uh, what are the the blocks, uh, the squares, they're pretty much concentrated to the left. The circles on the uninfected are concentrated to the right. So at least at the level of principal components, it tells you you're seeing something. If you go to the Mars setting, it asks under uh, the, what you're finding in the ground, uh, to what extent are things different from what you see in the standards that are already in the software. This would be a first way to cut in on it. Uh, pooled data infected and uninfected, you still see separation. Okay, that's just, if you like, going at uh, one kind of challenge. 
Now, I wanted to just talk about uh, one other one, uh, which gets closer to the, to the Mars setup, because as we indicated, you stick a spade in the ground, there's all kinds of stuff in it. There's organic compounds of various kinds, some are not. And uh, in order to separate those out, you're basically in the analogous situation to what's called trying to understand the phenomena of co-infection. So here you've got the animals infected with two kinds of parasites, hookworm and schistosomes. And the only point I wanted to make here is that listed on the left-hand margin are the actual molecules. So they all have organic formulas, quite a bit more complicated than the ones we showed at the beginning, but it's, that's the general picture. And with co-infection, data collected four weeks after infection, five weeks, that's the middle two columns, uh, you see increase or decrease in uh, concentration of those molecules as a function of both, uh, if you like, having, having this double infection. Then you see a column that says S. japonicum, and only a few arrows here, up or down. That corresponds, that's a comparison between what's, what occurs when there's a double infection versus a single infection, which is just this. Then there's the hookworm infection, not necessarily the same molecules activated. But basically, what you're, be, what you're able to do is get more complex mixtures understood in terms of some of the, uh, some of the building blocks and the components. And this kind of information is now sitting in the dendral system. The more complex stuff, which is this, is what you're going to be see what you're seeing for the first time compared with the standard. So this is your way of getting a characterization of what sits out there. Okay, I'll skip metabolites and cytokines. Okay, uh, I want to just take one short tour. This is going to be a bit of data analysis to just give a bit of a flavor for what also goes on uh, inside uh, one of these. Uh, organic molecule characterizers. This is a somewhat cleaner picture of raw data. This is NMR spectra. So again, across the horizontal axis, each one of these narrow bins corresponds to a variable. Now, if you take molecules as simple as the ones we showed at the start, there's nothing as complicated as this picture that'll come up. Because what you know in a laboratory setting is this peak here, this little one here, maybe this, those three, are all that would be sticking up at you, and that is the signature of a molecule. When you see something like this, it tells you you got a mixture of stuff that uh, you somehow have to disentangle. So that, that gets you to the Mars question. So this is, a, this is actually NMR spectra, and it's a study of an, uh, it's an attempt to ask the question, can I detect the presence of liver toxins uh, in rats by, by examining, uh, doing NMR spectroscopy on urine of them after they've been exposed to the toxin. So here's a, so this is going to be a data analysis strategy. This may or may not be familiar to uh, some, some or many of you, but uh, I'll use it in a couple of minutes in a setting that will be much more familiar, but I wanted to just show you what this looks like still in this chemical context. This is, a, uh, this is kind of a side pilot study in which you have 450 control animals. So that says strong information about, if you like, the baseline for comparison built into the computer system. T corresponds to treated animals, small number of those. So the question is, can you pull up some signal from 20 animals out of a pot of 470? Now, if all the control animals had a nice, clean signal and they were all the same, no sweat in principle. But just to tell you about some of the hair-raising things that go on, these are spectra that come from individual animals. And spectrum number one and spectrum number five, down in this corner, one and five, those correspond to treated animals. So between those, just these two, there's a huge amount of variation in whatever the molecules are that you're seeing in their urine. Then you take two, three, and four through the middle of this. Those are not carbon copies. Those are the standard. But it's telling you that there's some real variation in here that goes animal to animal. It's analog in the Mars situation is 
there's going to be real variation in soil composition depending upon where you stick a spade in the ground. And you want to pull signal out of all this stuff. OK, so what goes on here? What is recursive partitioning? How does it work? A simple caricature of this is you first scan all the variables. So uh, in this particular example, instead of 1,000 variables, it was down to about 400. So you scan each of these 400 bins. And you ask, if somebody said, you must select one bin uh, and whatever the amplitude is of the spectrum at the, in that bin to distinguish between treated and control animals, which would it be? So on the bottom, the 1.86, I'm sorry, at the top, the 1.86, that represents a chemical shift, which is in effect a labeling for a bin. The number uh, at the branch up there corresponds to scoring of amplitude that's in the, in the actual spectrum. And it says, you're going to partition this population into two groups, one of which you're after the, great, the best possible separation, one of which separates treated and controls cleanly. That's going to the right. One of which leaves you with a mix of six treated and 450 controls. So you hit a terminal node, so to speak, in this tree going to the right, going to the left, you say, well, let me partition further. Now I play the same game, but with this uh, 456, uh, this pile of 456 animals, I find that there's a new variable, the one labeled 8.3, a new amplitude, and I ask, which, for which animals are, are there spectra above that, uh, above that level? At location 8.3, for which ones are they below? For those that are below, there's no treated in that category. There's 111 controls. Keep going. Now you're down to 345 animals. Keep the splitting going. And when you get all the way down to the end, you've pulled out a list of locations in the spectrum that represent a signature of what differentiates treatments from controls. But, and you say, gee, isn't this fantastic? I did a perfect classification job. Well, consider you've got 400 variables, and uh, you got 400 variables, and in this instance, 400, uh, 470 animals. Uh, if I went to the denser spectra, I'd have 1,000 variables and 470 animals. So you're going in kind of in the opposite direction that you like to see in all the, if you like, conventional regression analyses. You have vastly more variables than you've got cases. And this is the same as what one runs into in these uh, gene expression analyses. But this is the beginning of uh, saying what's in the spectrum. So let me go one more step. And this is something that's, that's quite, a, quite a bit general. You can ask, is, let me go back here. Is this tree the only way you could talk about something consistent with the data that you've generated? Well, in this picture, on the left-hand side is a tree of that structure. It turns out, however, there are, uh, let's see, the S4 didn't come, didn't come through it's, uh, too well. There's two S4s here at point, at point 0.9 and then the 1.86 and 4.26. So basically, there's four splitting points which, which correspond to variables. But if you like, two different, uh, two different amplitudes for spectra within trees of that structure. It turns out that if you, uh, instead of asking the question, which is the variable that gives me the best discrimination at every stage, I say, which one is second best? And that's not a crazy thing to do, because the difference between best and second best can be very small in terms of numerical scoring schemes on these trees. And what you'll find is you can now produce a new kind of tree structure that's equi that is equivalent to the one that listed, listed under type A, and that it gives you exactly a perfect fit to the data. But it's not isolating exactly the same points in the spectrum. You can continue this exercise a bit and get the third set of uh, trees also, which give you, if you like, perfect fits to the data. And now you say, what am I going to do with all these candidates? These are candidate models. Well, you can ask about stability of these trees. And so if you go through the exercise of leaving out one animal at a time, a couple of animals at a time, regenerate the tree and reclassify, do you still get perfect, uh, do you still get perfect uh, 
fits to the data? Well, the answer is no, particularly when you leave out uh, a couple of animals at a time. And what you find is the very first tree we showed, uh, which is under type A, first line, gives you the highest number of errors when you, if you like, do this subsampling. And when you get all done with the subsampling, there's a set of, uh, there's a set of trees indica indicated by the arrows, which give you the fewest number of errors under uh, this removal of uh, two animals at a time and then regenerate the tree. So it's a cross-validation scheme. And those with the lowest error rates, you single out as the candidates to really describe, uh, if you like, what molecules are in the spectrum, because what molecules are in the spectrum are associated with these chemical shifts. So this is an exercise which I'm kind of showing in the simplest setting, but it's part of what goes on, uh, if you like, inside dendrol. Now, before leaving dendrol, uh, well, let me leave the longitudinal assessments out. Uh, before uh, leaving dendrol, let me say a few more words about it. Uh, what this ultimately succeeded in doing was allowing, indeed, detection of lots of organic molecules, uh, not only in the Mars context, but this was used in a lot, of a, a lot of other settings. It led to molecules where new experiments had to be done, since uh, basic properties, if you like, of some of those isomers weren't anywhere in the chemical literature. They were simply flagged and identified as a result of having, if you like, this kind of exhaustive catalog of what, to, of what could go on. So it's an exhaustive set of models. And the screening that went on it comes from screening through spectra of the kind we've showed here. So uh, if this may seem complicated at the start, let me just say this is about the simplest of what sits inside some of these expert systems. And this was the first one to get it going. Now, I wanted to just leave the, uh, I didn't want to leave you with just chemistry on this uh, recursive partitioning analysis, uh, and I was motivated to put in just one more example, largely as a result of James' interesting talk yesterday uh, with, uh, if you like, multidimensionality and an, an interest in predicting mortality. So I want to talk about exactly that. And so the technology we just showed you is going to be put to use, but in a totally different setting. So what's the game here? You have a set of biomarker measurements on an elderly population. So this is the MacArthur study of successful aging. And so everybody in this study is age 70 or more at baseline. And what you would do is you have systolic and diastolic blood pressure, C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, norepinephrine levels, epinephrine, uh, DHEA, and so on. So this you're getting from standard lab assays. Any physician who would be examining these patients could simply collect blood samples and do assays and basically find out levels or concentrations of each of these molecules. Some are associated with your immune system, like C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. Uh, others with the neuroendocrine system. And it's all giving you an indication of are you normally functioning or do you have levels, if you like, of some of the uh, levels of some of these compounds at excessively high or excessively low levels so that it's, if you like, putting you at risk for illness or in the worst case, death. So what we want to do is think of, you want to start with the set of, this is going to be, it's, I think, 15 variables to get started. Uh, and this is all information collected at a baseline. So obviously, everybody's alive. And we're going to ask who's not alive 12 years later and the question is, can you get a good prediction instrument using the information from this whole battery of variables? Now, there's not going to be anything unique to the number 15. You can extend this to something much larger. But here's a strategy that's uh, virtually a carbon copy of what we did just discussed with the spectra. So let's go in there and start generating these trees. So what have we got at the top? You have a population under study uh, where if you like, the mortality rate is 46%. And keep in mind, 46% 12 years after baseline. So 12 years after baseline says the minimum age of anybody uh, 12 years after uh, baseline, if they're still alive, is 82. So there's deaths taking place. And before you use any of the information, 
you've got a 46% mortality rate. Now you ask, if I was going to circle through all the compounds on which you have measurements, so this is analogous to scanning the spectra, and I had to pick out one that discriminated who's going to be dead or who's going to be alive, 12 years later, norepinephrine comes up in this pic uh, as, the, as the best option. 37.9 micrograms uh, per gram uh, creatinine is the cutoff point. If you're above that, you go to the right, and now you find there's a 66% death rate right at node 2 on the right, and only a 36% death rate if you go to, to node 1 on the left. So just using one piece of that information, you separate it out uh, dead from alive, beginning of a prediction instrument. So now, um, yeah. I mean, is it uh, because of the way you want to put it into a computer that it's important to choose? Um, I mean, you have a bunch of information, so why, do you, why is it so important to find the one that predicts it most? Rather than say, we have 15 variables, so... We're going to use them. This is an algorithm for doing it. It's not the only way to do it. You can do it a couple of variables. We're going to, basically, it's scanning all 15 variables. And it's saying, to get started, we want to generate a tree, which is easy to read. And so this is a way to do it. And you can ask, are there going to be biases, or will there be things you miss because of go, do, going this route? The answer is yes, but there's a way around it. That's going to be the next slide. Is the advantage of a tree, um, for the sake of the algorithm, like for, to help it, I mean, to make the computer think this way? That Not only does the computer think this way, but when you get done generating the tree, here's how to read it. Go into what you would call one of these terminal nodes. So, Node 12 down here, which ends up with 93% dead and 6.7% uh, alive. Okay. How do I read prediction into that uh, very high likelihood of death? I start at the top of the tree, and I make it myself a logical and statement that says, if in my record norepinephrine is greater than 37.9, C-reactive protein above 1.6, epinephrine above 20, all three conditions together predict death. <coughs> Who survives? Well, go to another place. Uh, and this tree, such as node 7, where 76% end up alive. Or, no, uh, yeah, node 3 is 85% end up alive. What are the criteria? Norepinephrine below 37.9. Use it again at a still lower level if you're below 20. Just using that variable alone, that's a good, that's a good prediction. Now, this is from scanning all the variables, but only a few of them entered into this tree. Now, there's reasons for that, which we'll see in a second. But let's just call this step one. And yes, it's easy to write computer algorithms to do this. Uh, let me just say one more thing, since medical diagnostics uh, is one of the things that's in the mice and expert system. Physicians love this kind of stuff. Why? It's exactly the way, uh, how to put it, it's the way they think. Because they like to have cutoff points. So this gives you cutoff points on a whole set of measurements. So, you know, they can go, I was going to say, it shows age. I was going to say with a three by five card <laughs> with cutoff points. Now they have an iPad and the, that same information is there. But basically, uh, you, can go, you can go through a whole wing of a hospital with records for pe uh, people that like this. And, uh, all you do is check the cutoff points, and you, you say who's at high risk, who's at low risk, and why. For the, for the mouse example, I mean, how is it different from taking all the 420 healthy mice, getting some distribution, probably distribution over their spectrum, and saying, okay, here we have a mouse. What's the probability from the healthy mouse distribution and the unhealthy mouse distribution? You'll have a really difficult time, mainly because of the huge amount of variance from mouth to mouth. The whole advantage of this kind of technology is it kind of reaches into this pot and says, pull out individual molecules and tell me which ones. And that seems to be a better way to do it. On the, that's on the previous ones. You can raise the question, is that a good way to go with this? Well, let me show you one more picture. Rather than one tree, here's a set of two, here's a set. 10 trees are generated. Now you ask how. If you go into this data set and take samples of size two-thirds of the whole population, random draw, with replacement, each time go and generate a tree. And don't only use, if you like, 
the best split at every stage in the tree, but look at second, third, fourth best splits. Why? Goodness of split criteria. There's an entropy measure that's used for that. Empirically, what you will frequently find that second, third, or fourth best splits are about four decimal points apart, even from the first one. So you say, well, let me try, let me put in, put in now means its other variables and put, put those in the tree and ask, where am I really getting the best discrimination? Well, here's 10 trees done on the same people. And <clears throat> what's in this is a list of the variables are on the, on the left-hand margin. And where you see the rows of black dots, that's telling you uh, exactly which variables came up dominantly throughout all this subsampling. A reason for doing this subsampling is if you do it many times, you're liable to see subsets of the population that have peculiar characteristics you wouldn't see if you did this analysis on the whole thing. And that's what you're looking for. You want to kind of extract the maximum in terms of what may predict death in a fairly heterogeneous population. So what you see is interleukin-6, which is an immune system measure. That's really across the board. Norepinephrine is heavily. But there's others that only appear in a few places. OK, so now what are we going to do with these trees? Each one of these trees, uh, the dots correspond to things that re uh, correspond to high risk. And so you have a logical end statement in each tree. And you can generate it by just simply looking vertically. It tells you uh, in terms of uh, the dot indicates a, bio, uh, set, a dot indicates it's in what you would call a high risk pathway. On tree number one here, there's two high risk pathways that go to high mortality. And a logical end statement associated with the corresponding variable says these are the things that predict death in that tree. You go to different trees. Different subsample of size two thirds, you get different end statements. So now, when you get all done with this, what can what can you do in a prediction instrument? This may sound fairly crude, but this is getting at a form of the aggregation step that James was talking about. You can say, all right, if I look at the people who fall into no high risk nodes, what's the survivor curve for them? What if they only four? fall into one high-risk pathway some here in, somewhere in the set of trees, another survivor curve, two, three, four, five high-risk pathways. Now, if there's any justice in this, as you get to the number of high-risk pathways a given individual is on, they should have a greater chance of death in the 12-year period. And so what you ought to see is a nested family of survivor curves that reflect that. And to see what the, whether or not that's the case, uh, on the top are the nested, is the nested family of survivor curves. And uh, the lavender on the bottom means you're in five or more high-risk pathways across the whole set of trees. Three to four is the blue, which is almost on top of it. If you're only on one to two high-risk pathways, that says you have a greater chance of longer life. And if you're on none of them, that ought to get closer to the healthier zone. And the picture on top is exactly for the big block of trees we just showed. Those were the men. The women have uh, somewhat simpler trees, and so their picture is here. And so this is a way to, if you like, discuss mortality in a somewhat more refined way. And if you ask, what's the kind of information that comes out of this? Let's go back here. Biological risk, males. It's an interplay. What, what is it that predicts high mortality? Elevated epinephrine, norepinephrine, low DHEA from the immune system, elevated C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, and fibrinogen. So you have that combination of things that, uh, if you like, elevated levels above cut points. And let me just say one thing about cut points. You can put them in yourself, or you can be an agnostic and say, let the, pro let the computer decide what the best cut point is that separates living from dying. And you ask, do you get to the same place as the clinical cut points if you do that, at least what clinicians would regard as high risk? Well, if this stuff is worth its salt at all, it ought to be able to uh, kind of see what's coming ahead and tell you cut points that are below what a, what a physician would say, uh, this person is really in serious danger. And that indeed is what comes out most of the time. So, this combination of things at the cut points generated by the program 
that's really telling you men are in trouble. The corresponding thing for women is down here, and so that's what comes out of this analysis. And so this is an application of it, uh, exactly what we showed on the, uh, on the chemistry example, but uh, put the use in another place. Uh, let me ask other questions here about any of this stuff. Wait, I'm sorry. Go, go, go ahead. The methodology that you discuss, uh, I mean, I'm not sure I follow so much, but I could follow. But uh, there is uh, this uh, this method support vector machine in machine learning. This is part of that stuff. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, I've actually you well. I've only told you about one aspect of this. One is where you use it kind of in an agnostic mode. You can go further and say, based on a priori knowledge from the subject matter, there's parts of these trees I know must, or particular variables that have to be in, and even prioritized in terms of importance. That would structure this in advance, and then you generate the rest around it. Uh, the other thing is, this only showed you binary splits. You can split on a couple of variables at a time. So, the support vector machine literature is, yeah, it's very close to this. Anybody else? Ah, sorry. So yesterday, um, you, I was thinking about your, the Bali example in terms of the decision tree and... Um, well, you're there. Yeah, exactly, you're there. But I, said, I was thinking about um, using it, to applying the decision tree approach to the, the yellow rain example where it's like as soon as, I guess, I wonder if it's an alternative way of not getting a, applying exact weights, but maybe something more like some sort of, a, like a slightly stronger type of ranking. So if you have, you know, high truth, you know, you think high truthfulness and high accuracy or something, then you have, you can kind of start branching out. Like you start kind of organizing the, the evidence according to, kind of, to a decision, in a decision tree, but maybe it, it does the same well, thing. Well, let's go and implement, uh, talk about what, how would you implement that in this language. You, you can do that. Uh, there's, two, uh, there's two outcomes to discuss. One is, if you like, the box and with the democracy. The other is there's a hierarchical arrangement. So those will correspond to the dead or alive in this picture. Then you've got lots of variables, and they're coming from all these different places. And now you want to ask in this tree, what some roots down the tree ought to take you into the democracy box, and some should take you into the hierarchy box. And uh, when you get all done, the best possible predictions you ought to be able to be making are those that go into the democracy box, if what we said yesterday has any virtue to it. Now, yes, I think you could do that. To the best of my knowledge, nobody's done it. Uh, I don't, I mean, there's, in principle, nothing stopping it. It would be a bit trickier if you went at the yellow rain in the same way, because uh, now you, uh, the places where you would get a bit tricky is in the pla uh, places where you have uh, doubts about the reliability of the data. Then you'd have to modify this kind of structure a bit. But yeah, there's nothing that says you can't do it. I don't know anybody that has, but uh, okay. Is the, uh, I should say, this is kind of a really stripped down version of a lot of what goes on inside some of the expert systems that focus on medical diagnosis, not surprisingly. Because uh, there, I mean, this is exactly, as I had said a few minutes ago, this is exactly the way physicians like to think about this stuff. and. Uh, it doesn't have to be dead or alive. It can be a diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes, and coronary heart disease. You have exactly the same, uh, the same kind of uh, structural arrangement. Let me just ask, is this technology familiar to people? Nobody uses this. Interesting. OK. Huh. All right. <laughs> uh, if you get interested, it's easy enough to do uh, Software for this is in R, which I think uh, is that goes everywhere. Uh, the one thing I'll warn you about this, and let's just get back to a tree to, to see this. Uh, 
You can use this in a blind mechanical way, which says always go after the best split at every stage in the tree. What you will frequently end up with, not necessarily this problem, but if you went to the valley irrigation scheme and put up a decision tree, my bet would be you would end up with something you couldn't interpret. Now, why is that? Because second, third, fourth best splits in these trees are numerically, in terms of goodness of split, very close to best. And so now you're in the business of having to say, I'm going to select on the basis of what I know, knowledge of, of the subject matter, which among a set of alternative variables that can enter a split is what I want to put in. Or you can force particular variables in at the various stages in the tree, and uh, with the expectation you would do actually much better in discriminating among your hypotheses when you get done. Now, my, why might you want to do that? If you think carefully about what was involved in this tree, this doesn't look very far ahead. It only looks at the very next step. If it looked two positions ahead, computationally, I mean, you've got a horrendous amount of computation involved, but if you know that, for example, what we have here uh, at going into node six from C-reactive protein, suppose I know that that actually doesn't belong there. That's a numerical accident and I should put, uh, put one of the other variables in there. Suppose I forced it in and then said, now I will bet that when I get further down the tree, letting it run again, on um, just first or second best splits, I'll do better discrimination than I, am, than I have at the terminal nodes here. Frequently that happens. So use of the subject matter to decide what might be forced in at various places, or if you like, an ability to hand tailor tree construction uh, tuned, to the, uh, tuned to what you know about the subject matter, I think, is a critical aspect of using this kind of thing. Now, let me just tell you, you can run into serious trouble with journal editors if you do that. And so you ask, well, why is that? Usually there's a pet statistician that's involved in the reviewing process, and anything that says that I use subjective judgment along the way to structure one of these trees, Forget that, that's out of business. You must have this automatic scheme. It's, quote, the best model numerically, and that's what you gotta go with, even if you can't interpret it. Now, I did run into that uh, the very first time I attempted to get a paper published with this. It told the truth, namely that there was ha this hand tailoring that went on. Rejected. Revise the paper and uh, basically keep the same trees and just say they're the best, but don't say that you hand tailored it. Fine, publish. Not a good way, not a good way to operate, but I'm, a, that, I'm just telling you that because this phenomenon is out there. Sorry, go ahead. Professor, how would one do inference in this context? Well, if you wanted to ask the question about significant differences between, uh, if you looked at ratio of dead to alive in terminal nodes, I mean, you could do it. There wouldn't be any problem with, stand with standard significance tests with this. So I use the terminal node, but if I have multiple trees that are, are how can I take it? Oh, then you're doing it, okay, then you've got a multiple comparisons business. It's the same, basically a subset of the same population if you're doing it with two-thirds samples. And uh, yeah, you have, a, it's actually a complicated, it would be a complicated multiple comparisons operation, but you could do it. in that context, do they just run a single tree or, or generate a whole forest? In the, in the context you're mentioning, do they generate single trees or go after a whole forest of the kind we discussed here? Uh, the papers have always, that I know, including the ones I wrote, unfortunately, use single trees. Because the forest, you really buy a lot. Yeah. You just see a lot of stuff. In fact, uh, four people in this group can verify you just sent them an email saying this forest idea is great. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. no, no, but the serious point is that this has been a very unexplained methodology, and there are 
the reason that growth is natural is that there's kind of an idea that there's growth regimes that uh, would apply to different subsets of countries and sort of like trying to identify. Oh, so that a tree is kind of a natural. Yeah, it's very natural. Uh, but the fourth, the, the issue that you brought up, that you need to engage first of all in judgment and the issue about the interpretability of the object at the end, as well as the about force as opposed to trees overall, uh, have not been seriously. That's, that's an interesting field disparity because I got into this actually in the, through uh, collaborating with physicians. It was in clinical neurology. And they love this stuff as opposed to various scales, which are additive combinations of responses, uh, and in fact, on the same variables. And chemists have been using this since uh, about the mid-1960s. So it's exactly on the kind of problem we talked about. So there's this vast literature out there that doesn't intersect with economics, that uh, people have really developed it uh, a long distance. But OK, I didn't mean to, how to put it, make a pitch to invade a new field. <laughs> I, I want you to invade it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the end, this is testing for different interactions. Well, it is, yeah. And the problem is they, they multiply, right? You, you wait for it. So I can imagine writing down all possible interactions. Is this the best way to sort of sort you would, and the, uh, Well, you know, it would be something so unstable if you did it in the standard regression setup. I mean, basically what this is doing at every stage, it, it works, it, it does incredibly better than any of the regression schemes when there's lots of nonlinearities here. I mean, that's where this is really doing its thing. And it's also picking up uh, the, yeah, talk about interactions. In the mortality example, it was a six-way interaction that got picked up and isolated through this technology. Now, if you tried to do that through some regression scheme, I think you got trouble. I mean, well, let me phrase it in a slightly different way. What this is getting at, it's not uh, trying to ask, what are the variables that matter? It's asking, what are the conditions that matter? It's looking for conjunctions of conditions. Because when you uh, reason your way down a tree with an and statement, you're stating not just the variable, but uh, values of it, above or below some threshold. And so it's that set of conditions about which you're making a logical and statement that this is trying to isolate. Well, what if, I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of the model of the interactions regression model, can I think of it as kind of a stepwise regression, right? Well, this is. <laughs> yeah, it really is stepwise regression. There's all the problems of stepwise regression, right? That the sequence. So is there any kind of optimality? Oh, well, this is uh, not if you run one tree. This was the whole point of doing the, su the subsampling and generating many trees. Because right. you look at the, across the set of trees that come up. Uh, I mean, there's quite a bit of variation there. And you want to see it. And then it's not necessarily selection of a tree. You've got a set of combinations of things that are in the population. You've got an and statement you can make about them. Those are the high risk conditions. And uh, then that's used as your prediction instrument. It's just that in this six-way interaction, there's a lot of choices to go in terms of which way I split. So I can think about forming the splits in terms of pairs, right? So I think there's some a priori notions like that. And I think variable one and two go together as, a, as one natural split, maybe. Oh, then you put them in in advance. That constrains the trees. Oh, yeah. So a, a three and four division on one. I mean, just I just wonder how you bypass that. So you're saying it's not it's not regression. I'm not doing all of Well, actually, depending yeah. upon whose papers you read, it gets called tree structured regression. Right. But I mean, analytically, you know, it would be like running multiple regressions, not in some sense. Yeah, so, but I would do. But it, uh, but I guess what I'm saying is. To do it well, it needs to be done in a non-automated way. Yeah. Here's the, I mean, here's the thing. Well, uh, well, okay. Yeah, uh, here's, here's the thing. Uh, if you don't use, you know, second, third, fourth best splits, uh, generating alternative trees, you can really be led to stuff that is absolutely meaningless. In fact, to uh, say a bit more, just criticizing some good friends and colleagues of mine who put together this software called CART. Uh, the original CART program, you couldn't get inside it. 
And so it generated the best trees using, if you like, the best numerical uh, split, uh, split criteria at every one of those nodes. And people started saying, I'm getting, yeah, I get good trees out, but they, don't, they can't interpret it. And I mean, the trouble there is that the goodness of fit criteria for the tree do not have anything to do with the subject matter you're working on. Now, to press this a bit further, and uh, this comes back to this first clinical neurology example uh, where I mentioned, you know, a, the paper, a paper that got rejected because we said that uh, we interfered with the process, made judgments on which variables went in. Well, if you could tune the numerical fitting criteria for the tree to the subject matter, I mean, then you ought to be able to let things run automatically. But now, you would have to create a new goodness of fit criteria virtually for every problem. And I don't know anybody that wants to sit down and do that, but I think the only alternative you've got if you don't want to try go that route is you're going to have to have a conversation with the, with the tree as it's getting generated. Mr. Gretta, I got question at the beginning. Ah. Oh, yeah. I mean, is that getting at some of what you were after or not? Or are we off in a different direction? <laughs> OK. Anybody else on this? OK. Uh, I've about run out my time. So why don't I just stop here? And uh, if there's more questions, great. If not, thank you very much. <laughs>